Well, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Neil Ferguson. Neil, I think it would be fair to say, is the preeminent and most known economic historian of our age. I had the enormous privilege of meeting him when a very good friend of mine uh, and I hosted a small dinner for he and Ayan Hersey Ali, who was with us this morning, in Sydney. And the things that they both had to say were of such value uh, that my host and I asked him the next day, would he be prepared to subject himself to a conversation with me that we could record and float into cyberspace uh, in the modern way of uh, publishing, if you like, and he kindly said yes. During that first conversation, which took place in his office at the Hoover Centre at uh, Stanford University, I asked him as part of our conversational exchange what he saw as the three greatest threats to our freedom and prosperity in the West. And he answered that in ascending order, he saw them to be, thirdly, the third greatest threat, Islamic terrorism writ large as each iteration becomes worse than the last, and particularly uh, if uh, you know, bad state actors manage to obtain especially horrendous weapons. The second he saw as the very real possibility of miscalculation between the superpower and the rising superpower. But the greatest threat, he said, with which if we could only find some resolution and some settlement on and move on from, would help us deal with the other threats was that we have come to loathe our history. The very things we've been talking about today, we are loaded with that, at best, self-doubt, at worst, a, quite a streak of self-loathing of our own past, our own values, uh, and the things that we once were so ready and willing to defend. So it's my very great pleasure now to invite Neil Ferguson to address you. Thank you, John. Well, thank you very much indeed, John. It's a great pleasure to be here at this inaugural event. Ladies and gentlemen, liberal democracy is in trouble. And it's in trouble, I think, for three reasons. The first you probably think is obvious, and that is the rise of illiberal democracy. This is a common theme. Friends of mine like Fareed Zakaria and Larry Diamond have been arguing this for years. If you read Freedom in the World on a regular basis, you will find, and I quote, that global freedom declined for the 17th consecutive year in 2022. From a high of 44 states in 2007, the number of liberal democracies has fallen, according to the Varieties of Democracy Project, to just 32. Whereas illiberal democracies, that is to say places where there are elections but no rule of law, no true protection of individual liberty, are up from 46 in 2007 to 58, nearly double the number of liberal democracies. Pure autocracies are also up, according to the same source, from 23 in 2018 to 39. Some of you will be familiar with data like that, or like those. But it's actually worse than that. It's only around a half of all the countries of which we can really be sure that are uh, democracies. That is, they held recently meaningful free and fair multi-party elections. Only 24 of them are more than 60 years old. 20 of the world's democracies are less than 19 years old. I wonder if you realize how in the great scheme of history, short-lived the age of democracy is. As I said, 
of roughly 90 democracies, only a third qualify as liberal. But if you look at the share of the world's population that lives in liberal democracies, that has fallen from what was a secular high of 17% in the 1990s down to just 30, 13, 1,3% in 2022. There are many people who pin great hope on India, which is certainly a democracy. But if you think it's a liberal democracy, then I have a tower block in a tier three Chinese city to sell you. That's the first reason that liberal democracy is threatened. The second and perhaps more serious reason is that liberal democracy in the United States, the greatest of all the democracies, seems to be threatened from within. In a recent poll conducted earlier this year, 74% of Democrats agreed that American democracy is, quote, imperiled. And about 75% of Republicans also agreed with that statement. The problem is that Republicans and Democrats do not agree on the nature of the threat to democracy. The Republicans think that it's posed by Democrats, and the Democrats think that it's posed by Republicans. But the third, and I think most serious, threat that liberal democracy faces today is geopolitical. What I've called the axis of ill will has now formed. Unlike the axis of evil that David Frum came up with for George W. Bush back in 2002, this axis exists. There is meaningful coordination between Russia, Iran, China, and North Korea. They coordinate economically, they coordinate militarily, they coordinate strategically. But because of China's enormous economic scale and technological prowess, this axis poses a much more serious strategic threat than any past axis, including the axis of the 1930s. Now, when you ask yourself what we can do in the face of these threats, it's important to recognize the root causes of the weakness within liberal democracies. And this is true not only of the United States, I think it's also true of the United Kingdom, perhaps all the Anglosphere countries and many other liberal democracies too. More than 10 years ago, I delivered the BBC Wreath Lectures, and I gave those lectures on the topic of the great degeneration of Western institutions. I recently had cause to go back and look at the book, The Great Degeneration, again. For those of you uh, who don't remember these as if uh, the lectures were given yesterday, let me remind you of the argument I made in those four lectures. I said there are four forms of degeneration that we see around us. The first is essentially fiscal. The mounting public debts of Western democracies represent a fundamental breach in that contract between the generations that Edmund Burke writes about in Reflections on the Revolution in France. The second form of degeneration I pointed to was the degeneration of market economies under a growing burden of regulations issuing forth from the administrative state. The third was that degeneration, most obvious in the United States, of the rule of law into something more like the rule of lawyers. And the fourth was that weakening of associational life, which I think finds its clearest expression in the degeneration of educational institutions under a combination of excessive state power and a kind of infiltration, ideological infiltration, from within. The third of the four things that I want to say to you this afternoon is that we must, in the face of this ongoing degeneration, but none of the things I talked about 11 years ago 
have improved. In the face of this ongoing degeneration, we must organize better, much better, to uphold the values of individual freedom against all the forms of tyranny that threaten it. And this effort cannot and must not be confined to the realm of politics. Civilization is too precious an achievement to become a conservative project only. Classical liberals, you can help too for all the sins of omission and commission that you have committed in the past. The fourth and final thing I want to say is that the most important challenge we face, and this is now clear, is to end the politicization of education. Because this must be fundamental to our succession planning. Let me give you a few brief illustrations of what I'm talking about. In the United States today, according to Heterodox Academy, 59% of students agree that the climate on their campus prevents them from saying things that they believe. That is the state of American universities. And the most common reason they give, this is what 62% say, is that they're reluctant to discuss controversial topics because their peers might make critical comments to others after class. The Challey Institute for Global Innovation revealed in a recent uh, survey, and this really shocked me, that 85% of self-described liberal students would report a professor to the university if the professor said something that students found offensive. And 76% of those surveyed said they would also report another student who said something that they considered offensive. I've long warned of a creeping totalitarianism light that has seeped into the educational system, not only in the United States, but around the English-speaking world, and which we can now detect not only at universities, but even in primary schools. The events of the last three weeks have confirmed how deep the rot is, according to a poll published last week. 84% of all American respondents said they sided with Israel over Hamas in the wake of the terrorist atrocities of October the 7th, but that figure drops to 52% amongst 18 to 24-year-olds. In another poll, 26% of that age group, 18 to 24, said that they believed the solution to the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians was for Israel to be given to Hamas and the Palestinians. As they like to say in America, let that sink in. And the United Kingdom has a similar degeneration amongst its young people. Which side in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict do you sympathize with more? YouGov asked just the other day. 21% of all adults said Israel, rising to 37% amongst the 65 and older age group, just 11% of 18 to 24 year olds in, U in the UK YouGov survey said Israel, 39% said the Palestinians. Ladies and gentlemen, the great French political and social thinker Alexis de Tocqueville saw as the principal threats to liberty, egalitarianism, socialism, centralization, irresponsible intellectuals, and incidentally, Islam. And he saw the principal bulwarks preserving and defending liberty as being aristocracy, religion, and associational life. I want to quote Tocqueville in conclusion. I have, he said, an intellectual inclination for democratic institutions, but I passionately love Liberty, legality, the respect for rights. Liberty is my foremost passion. That is the truth. And ladies and gentlemen, that should be our truth too. Thank you very much indeed.